Let us now talk about uh, Turing machines. So as we've learned, we've seen uh, deterministic finite automaton and non-deterministic as well. that are able to recognize regular languages. We also learned about pushdown automaton that can recognize context-free languages, right? So we introduced these two uh, families of languages. First are regular, second one are context-free. And we introduced uh, some kind of machine that is able to recognize such languages. Now we are met with the notion of non-context-free uh, languages. And it would be nice to have another machine that is able, that is a bit more complex, that is able to recognize languages of such problems. In fact, we're going to go a bit further and we're going to introduce a machine that is able to recognize any, basically simulate anything that a computer could do. And these are known as Turing machines. So Turing machines, they have been used quite a lot and they were uh, created for that purpose, to really understand the foundations of mathematics. So not specifically to computer science. And in fact, when they were created, we didn't even have computers at the time. They are uh, what we use, or they are one way of, of characterizing computation. That means what is the notion of computing, of, of representing a automa automatic um, digestion of information, uh, which is computation. And then how can we represent this with a machine? That's what uh, Turing machines are introduced, are trying to introduce. They're, uh, basically, they're trying to represent, if you have a series of operations that can be reproduced by a human, that's how in their con inception was uh, designed, actually. It was, imagine, it could take for a long time, but if you can define a certain series of steps that any human could do, then the Turing machine should be able to perform. Uh, so very mechanical. But in fact, that idea is actually what is behind uh, computers and all that. We're actually going to talk about the history of uh, Turing machines in our next lecture. So for today, we're mostly going to focus on, um, I'm going to show you essentially what is a Turing machine. How does it run? Um, and that's basically it. Another thing I wanted to add is we continue talking about these things that we say are decision problems. That is, we have a, a certain mathematical formula that we're trying to satisfy for a given value, which we this value is a sequence of characters, as we've seen. So basically a word, and what we check, uh, the language as we've learned is just this formula that is saying is this word in this formula, right? In this, does it, does it have a, a certain property P if you want to generalize the, the notion? And that's what Turing machines are also going to be um, characterizing. So this is essentially what we've been learning in this course. And now we're at the end, right? So we're at the end. And what we want to really understand is now let us think about these various levels. We've learned about regular languages. We've learned that all regular languages are context-free and that some context-free languages are not regular. So for example, A of N, B of N is not regular and it is context-free. And then we learned that there are some languages that are not uh, context-free and they are, uh, for instance, uh, A of N, B of N, C of N, uh, that is not regular. So now, what we're going to introduce is this set right here, or this uh, class of languages known as decidable languages. And then we're also going to introduce Turing recognizable languages. And finally, all languages. And Turing recognizable languages basically what are all the things, what are all the decision procedures that we can use computers to implement? Okay, so this is giving us a very interesting domain to study, which is what can computers really do? And more interestingly, what can they not do? That is going to be covered by this green portion. And we're actually going to be showing that this is uh, what is the frontier between these two and what is the frontier between these two. 
where, where it's decidable, we'll see in a, in a moment what it is, but I can give you an intuition. Basically, any decidable language is one where you have a certain machine that is always able, in a finite an amount of time, to say either yes or no. So this is more related to how Turing machines work. So once we introduce Turing machines, decidability will be a bit more obvious. Okay, so now let's move on to to introduce the notion of Turing machines. And first, let's remember what is a DFA or an NFA. As you might imagine, we let's consider this. This should be more like a NFA, right? Because there are no two outgoing edges here. But let's assume this is any kind of deterministic finite automaton. It could be either DFA or NFA. What we have is always a certain machine, and we have the input that we are processing, right? That's usually what we do. We start from the beginning, and whenever we read a letter, we advance in the state. So let's say we could start here, and then we read B, maybe we moved here to Q3, and then eventually moved somewhere else, eventually reached uh, Q2, and at that point we have read B, B, A, and A, and now we want to know if we are able to accept the rest of the string, which has A, A, and we would accept it if we can reach Q4, right? That's what we've learned how a DFA operates. And we can separate these two things, right? We can separate the input and we can imagine the input. So far, we've just been thinking of the input as a string that we send to the machine and then it says yes or no. But we could very easily imagine that this input is really just um, a portion of the memory of the machine. And what my machine does, it, it has a place, a, a pointer or a current cursor, right? Um, which is saying, what is the current position of the memory where I'm in, right? And it will jump from first to second to fourth. So always forward, never backwards. So a PDA is very similar, right? We still have a machine and it operates pretty much like an NFA. But it does have a, a, a novelty, which is now it has a stack, an unbounded stack that we can push elements into it. So the memory can grow. And the input is still the same. So you still have, so now you have two portions of memory, one that is fixed where we only read. And then we have a stack which may grow unboundedly and where we can read and write, where we can perform uh, a push and therefore re write, or we can do a pop and therefore read slash write. Um, so essentially these are the two other things that the machine has besides moving, right? The mechanical part, which is the states and the transitions. So now the Turing machine, it generalizes the, the notion of, of input into a read and write memory that is unbounded. The one we've learned, we usually call this a tape because of old times but you can just imagine it as an unbounded memory, okay, that starts in somewhere and it grows, grows, grows. Uh, you can imagine that is the whole memory of your computer, but unbounded. You can make it, you, there's always more space if you move it uh, as far as you want. That is one difference. So you, you have an unbounded memory, whereas with the DFA, this memory is always bounded and this memory is always bounded and this one is only read only. Here you have to read only and write, read write. But now you have one unbounded and you can read and write, plus you can move in both sides. And as you might imagine, because now you have more degrees of freedom, you will have more expressiveness. Okay, that's the basic idea. So, whereas in this one, you can only move in one direction, so you only have one degree of freedom, and you cannot write only in that degree of freedom. Here you can move both ways and you can read and write. You have more degrees of freedom, right? You have more variability, more um, behaviors that cannot be represented here that can be, and as we will see, that can be represented with this kind of machine. So the machine has the ability to move right or left on the input. It has the ability to write and read from the input and test, right? It, it made, it, as usual, you, you only read, advance if you read a certain character, you still have that kind of, you also have a special character that represents null or void or whatever is your favorite programming language. But it's just, it represents the absence of something. 
we use the this signal white space a white space right? sometimes I think in the book it's called null or something else um, and that's basically the novelty okay so we are able to know where which part of the tape was unused by reading this character was never written to okay and that's basically it also the machine when you start it you you give an initial input and that is the a pre-written part of your memory. Then, what else that we talked about? Um, okay, so one thing we might want to do is we talked about the tape head. This is known as the tape head, which is just the cursor that points to a memory location, uh, and that's what we use to to move around. But how do we know if we have um, accepted a certain state well we can just if we reach a certain accepting state that is enough for us to accept uh, a certain input and the input is the initial data that you write to memory uh, and now what you need to do is now the cursor can do um, check for the input and then either move right or left and then you can say so the first bit is what are you reading the second bit is what are you writing? And then the third component is are you moving left or right? That's what's gonna that's what we're gonna use as notation. Um, one thing that is special about Turing machines is that it has a single initial state and a single accepting state. There's only one of each. Uh, and then as long as you can reach the accepting state, you are you have terminated. Another thing that is different is that Turing machines are deterministic. They're not. So the ones we are introducing are deterministic. Eventually, we're going to learn about, in the next lecture, we're going to learn about non-deterministic ones. But for now, we only care about deterministic ones. And usually, people call the machine itself the, con uh, the control or the program. And this is the memory. So. In, in Turing machines, there is a, a big difference, or there are actually two big differences with respect to how we a res, res, um, accept a certain string, and also how do we reject a certain string. Okay, so accepting a string happens as long as you can reach the only accepting state. So you don't have to consume the input in any way. And in fact, as you will see, the memory has no notion of um, consuming as we have in um, NFA and PDA. In PDA and NFA, whenever you read, you move to the right. So the condition to conclude is twofold. You need to, to make sure you're at the end of your input, right, where you consumed all the input, and you are also in an accepting state. So you have those two conditions. In a Turing machine, it's easier. Or sorry, you only have one condition, which is have you reached an accepting state? And if you did, you're good to go. So you, so you don't actually care about what is in memory. So there's no notion of I've read this character or not, or I need to be at this position of the memory. You don't. You can be in any position of the memory. The only thing you need to, to know is whether or not you have reached that accepting state. So that's one difference. The other difference is that you can certain inputs will actually make the machine loop forever. So that means that regardless of, um, you know, you can perform another input and the machine will be advancing somewhere, but it never, ever, ever reaches the accepting state. And that is also a possible outcome, which is to say that the machine can do either of three things. It can directly accept, it can move to a rejecting state, where it rejects if it reaches that state, or it can loop forever. So these three behaviors are a bit different than a, a, regular, um, a regular machine like a DFA and FA, and they're different than a PDA because all of them, they either accept or reject for any string. There's no in-between. Uh, whereas with the Turing machine, it can loop forever, and that means not accepting. So rejecting is two, actually two behaviors. Either you halt, in a rejecting state, so you stop and you reach a rejecting state, 
or you are looping forever. And in both cases, you are rejecting the string. In accept it, you just reach the accepting state. So in the next video, we're going to see a few examples of Turing machines so that we get a feel, intuition of how Turing machines work. We're not going to spend too much time in understanding the formalism behind Turing machines because we, I only want you to learn the intuition behind what is a Turing machine and how does it work, not really how to formally write it because in the theoretical part, we're going to use something that is not exactly a Turing machine. We're going to use Turing machines indirectly, as you'll see.